Well, the occupations of my special guest are many and varied. He's a singer, a dancer, a marimba player, a drummer, a choreographer, and the associate producer of The Lawrence Welk Show. Please welcome Jack Himmel. Hi, hey, Mary. Jack. Well, what do you think looking back at this show from 1968? Oh, the show we did in 68? Yes. Well, you know, first of all, every show I see brings back memories. But, uh, you know, I would always try to find, you know, songs that are a little different. And I found this song called I'm the Sound Effects Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lawrence always loved showcasing young talent. When you were the new kid on the block, did he ever give you any coaching on your solos? Well, you know, he hired me right on the air in 1957. And he hired me more or less as a marimba soloist and tap dancer. And in those days, we would rehearse the music for the television show at the Aragon Ballroom. So when it was my turn to uh, rehearse with the band, uh, Lawrence had a uh, habit of uh, maybe wanting to make some changes <laughs> on the solo <laughs> I was going to play that week. So he'd make these changes, and he'd say, uh, Now, Jack, uh, why don't you work on these changes, and we'll come back to your number a little bit later in rehearsal. Well, that's fine. But where do I take a marimba and go in a corner somewhere <laughs> and practice these changes he wanted without disturbing the rehearsal? So I finally decided the best place for me to, to practice was in the men's room. So <laughs> I went to Lawrence and I says, Lawrence, when you're ready to do my number again, you know, rehearse my number, I'll be in the men's room. <laughs> he said, okay. So when the band would take a break, he'd come in the men's room, see how I was doing. In fact, he would make some more changes. <laughs> and anybody in the band wanted to use the men's room, he'd stop me and say, boys, you can't come in here right now. I'm rehearsing with Jack Immel. <laughs> now, I'm just glad they had, they had two men's rooms at the Aragon Ballroom. <laughs> Now, a marimba is not the easiest instrument to take on the road. No. It you isn't. must have had a few adventures with that. In the beginning, I did. You know, the, the airlines in the early days couldn't handle the weight and the uh, cargo space that they, they, they do now. And uh, the marimba weighed about 200 pounds. And when you cased it up, it had four big cases. And so Lawrence came to me and he, he said, Jack, he said, uh, we may have a little trouble taking your marimba on this first road trip. He said, because of the weight of the instrument and, and, and the cargo space. And uh, when we'd go out on tour, we'd play over about 12 towns and they were all major cities. So he said, would you mind if uh, we rented a marimba in each town? Well, I didn't see anything wrong with that, playing all these major cities. Things went pretty well the first three or four days. And then the promoter, Bill Daly, who was a wonderful guy, we, Bill and I became real good friends later on in years. But it was his job to find a marimba for me in each town. <laughs> and he said, uh, now he says, tomorrow, Jack, we may have a little trouble with your marimba. He says, the only one we could find in this whole town was one that was specially made for a guy that was six foot ten inches tall. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, if I were you, I would go over to the building tomorrow early and check this instrument out and make sure it's going to be okay for you. So I went over to the building and... Uh, the keyboard came clear up to here on me. I can see you now. <laughs> and when I'd play it, my elbows, it looked like I was going to fly away any minute, you know. Mm -hmm. But I worked at it and worked at it, and finally I got it down to where I, I, I could probably get through the number, for one night anyway. Now, in those days, I would play the first chorus on the marimba, and then I would jump over my marimba. And for some reason, I just hadn't thought about jumping over this, this thing. I had been so, in, so worried about hitting the right notes that it, I, it, 
it just didn't dawn on me that I got to jump over this thing. So now we're doing the concert. I'm playing the first chorus, and I'm about halfway through the chorus, and I'm saying to myself, oh no, I got to jump over this thing. <laughs> I understand the guys in the band were placing bets whether or not I was going to make it, make it or not. But the only thing I can say, Mary, is I was 24 years old. There were 15,000 people out there. I got Lawrence smiling at me in the corner. I got the wonderful Lawrence Welk band back of me. I'm pretty sure the Lord was on my side. The adrenaline was going, and I made it. <laughs> In fact, I almost landed in the front row of the audience. <laughs> Lawrence was such a giant in the industry. Oh, yeah, he and was a superstar. He was wonderful to his audience, whether oh. it was on stage or in a coffee shop in the morning before oh, yeah. he got on the bus. You had a personal experience in Milwaukee one time. Yeah, I think it was Milwaukee. Um, the, uh, the hotel we're staying at was only two blocks from where we're where we're doing the show. And uh, usually you take a bus, you know. But it was close enough that most of the guys walked. And uh, the show's at 8 o'clock, and I decided to go over a little early and practice. So I'm in the lobby around 6 o'clock, going over to, to the building, and I run into Lawrence. And Lawrence says, where are you going? I said, well, I th thought I'd go over to the building and practice a little bit. He said, well, I'll walk along with you. Now remember, this is only two blocks we're talking about. This was the longest two blocks I've ever walked in my entire life. We couldn't take but two or three steps that somebody, you know, would want his autograph. But it, it, it didn't stop there. He would hold a con conversation with him. Uh, where are you from? Do you watch the show every week? How do you like this show? How do you like that show? Here's Jack Emma. Would you like his autograph? You know, it would take a couple minutes. And, 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 and then she'd take three more steps. Well, hello, how are you? And then and the same thing again. Yeah. We got to the building. We left at 6 o'clock. We got to the stage door entrance at a quarter after 7. And it was just two blocks. But what was amazing was how a man with his reputation, and he was a superstar, had that much humility. And uh, because superstars just don't do that. Even the, even the nice guys, you know, the nice superstars, they're always, they're, they're gonna pull up in a limousine, probably with a police escort, some of them even have bodyguards, but not Lawrence. He walked, he walked those two blocks and signed. And you know, it was as important to him, I think, to sign autographs and talk to these people as it was to perform on the stage. I understand. We, we would play buildings. We played the, the, the Roop Arena. Adolph Roop Arena is in Kentucky. Holds 25,000 people. And we filled that place up. And we even put seats, you can put seats on the playing floor. So we could get another three or 4,000 on the, on the floor. Now, if you have seats completely around this arena, you have the stage at one end. So back of the stage, You've got about three or four thousand feet uh, 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 seats, and they would sell out. They'd sell those seats back of the band, and they were told when they bought the tickets. They said, "Now all you're going to see are the backs of these people's heads." They didn't care. They 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 bought those t seats just to see because they could see us backstage. Yeah. And and Lawrence said would say now kids, make sure that those people that got bad seats, make sure you go over and talk to them and sign autographs. And, uh, but that's the way he came up, you know, six, it was hard, tough for him. You know, coming off a farm, the fourth grade, you know. For him to be accepted 
by millions of people, he he never forgot that. Yeah. You know, he had a desire. He told me that. <clears throat> I can get this out. I get sort of emotional when I talk about him. Uh, he takes took a bunch of uh, pitchforks and he would put them in the ground in the barnyard and pretend that it was an orchestra. Wow. So he had a dream and that was going to be as obvious as that man was going to make it. Yeah. Quite a guy. Yeah, you know, you hear that old saying, they threw them all the way when they made him. <laughs> Well, that certainly holds true with him. Well, Jack, you have been married to a wonderful woman. Sure have. For 54 years. 54 years. Norma. Norma. What's the secret? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, we, we met on a Ferris wheel. and We were in a sixth grade, and we... I'm not trying to make a joke out of this, but we've been going around together ever since. <laughs> <laughs> we just hit it off, and uh, she uh, she loves the work I'm in, and she loves to be around the people that uh, that are in the show. And you know, the, the wives all know each other, and uh, she's she's a real good friend of. Ken Lilo's wife in Maryland, and she loves Joanne Castle, you know, because she's, she's so much fun, you know. And um, she, she she loves the show. She's a fan. <laughs> she's the first one to sit down and watch the show. You get in here, Jack, the show's on. You're going to miss the, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and she's put up with a lot for me, too. I mean, I used to practice in Miranda three or four hours a day. It drove me nuts, <laughs> and of course the neighbors nuts. But uh, she never complained about it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank for you for being with us. <laughs>